strategically there. His uh, mixture of salt and pepper, hair, and boyish good looks and mysterious scar has made him quite a hit with the ladies since his move out to Southern California. I believe it. I he believe uh, also it. has a recent Grand Prix top eight here in Oakland and a standard open win that you and I covered in Los Angeles a little while ago. He is playing Boros again. He has gone with a very aggressive build with four main deck copies of Azorius Arrestor and four copies of Boros Charm. So He's going to start off with everyone's favorite one drop in Dried Militant. He's playing against Michael Roy playing Esper Control. Part of the reason that Ben actually played Boros in Los Angeles when he did win is because he had a really good match against Esper Control due to Boros Charm, due to Brave the Elements, due to an aggressive clock, can pace the game in a certain way. You see Ben and Michael are both started 1-0 in this tournament. And, you know, if Michael's familiar with Ben, familiar with his win in Los Angeles uh, about a month ago now, uh, he's probably got an idea of what Ben's on. He certainly knows now because of the tournament dried Militant. Yeah. But this is a matchup that I know that uh, Lundquist is very comfortable in. The Between Boros Charm and a really good, cheap base of creatures, you see Azorius Arrestor out of the board, uh, the Boros deck is definitely a natural predator on Esper. Now, one thing also to keep in mind here is you take a look at Ben Lundquist's deck list, a card that he was playing uh, that, that drew some uh, some curious responses from myself and many other people was Azorius Rester when Imposing Sovereign is a card that does exist. Ben played two at that tournament, and I've been playing his deck list ever since Los Angeles on Magic Online when I play. It's cheap, it's easy, it's fun. I like white creatures, obviously. He's playing four Resters now. Yes, four. So the theory here, as you see Ben add a Johnny to the board, is... It, basically, this is in place of Imposing Sovereign. The You see the counter go on to Dry Militant here. And Ben, very wise with his counter there, as ultimate price kills the Azorius Arrestor, is the Boros deck has so many quality two-mana creatures. Imposing Sovereign basically asks you to play it first to get maximum value out of it. Whereas uh, with the Zordius Arrestor in your deck, you can play your Daring Skyjacks and your Precinct Captains first and still be able to take care of blockers. It fulfills much of the same role that uh, Imposing Sovereign does, but it doesn't cause you to have to play it on a as early as Imposing Sovereign forces you to play it. Mm -hmm. Hero's Downfall is going to take care of the Planeswalkers to the Dried Militant, a Godless Shrine going to come to play tapped and pass the turn back. How do you feel about the removal spawn on the Planeswalker instead of the actual creature? Uh, it depend I mean, it's reasonable to assume that Lundquist has additional creatures in hand, so uh, I don't I don't mind the, the use of the kill spell in that spot, but taking another three-point hit this turn is a, is a pretty big cost, too. So without knowing the contents of Michael's hand, I can't really say. I, I imagine it's close, though. Well, back up, but Johnny makes this play a little bit questionable. As Dry Milton's going to turn into a 4-3, coming to the red zone, knock Roy down to 11, so kind of the same situation here. He's got a little bit more mana to work with instead of... But he's got a 4-3 facing down and an Ajani that's on five counters. Ultimate, it's not really a big deal in this matchup for Ajani, but the double strike is uh, potential for a lot of damage as Nyland's going to come into play here for Roy. And Lundquist played a Sacred Foundry untapped, which is a very loud representation of Brave the Elements here as well. Yes, it is. And we'll see if he does have one of those hanging out in his hand. Of course, those instants are removed from the game because of dry Militants text. <laughs> saying that those are going to be gone. Not that that's a big deal, but five mana up here for Roy. See, Lundquist draws his card for the turn. It is a Plains. There is a Temple to get things started, so we'll take a look at the top card. He is going to consult his hand before he places that somewhere. The Boros Charm, the card he's splashing for here. That's why you see the red mana and some sideboard options as well, like Museum Orders and things of that nature. I know that the number of Boros Charms has kind of fluctuated. Uh, yes. Some play two main deck, as we've seen in the top eight of Grand Prix Vienna. Some people play four main deck, uh, like Ben Lundquist is doing this weekend as he's going to pump up that Dried Militant and come across for five. How do you feel about the number of Boros Charms you should be playing in this deck from main to side? Uh, you know, four throughout the main or just a couple as Cyclonic Rift is going to target the Dryad? Lundquist has to be really happy about the types of cards that Michael's playing so far. Really light on removal, no Blood Baron yet. Um, it's very metagame dependent. For example, Lundquist played zero at Grand Prix Albuquerque sure. uh, last weekend. He played Lightning Strike in the main because he was anticipating a lot more creature matchups. Uh, I think Lundquist has just decided this weekend he wants to build the most aggressive possible build, which is why you see all the arresters and four copies of Boros Charm. I know Pat Cox is an advocate of playing two in the main deck and having an additional one or two in the sideboard for Esper specifically. Uh, so uh, it's 
the, it's a mixture of m being metagame specific and also, uh, you know, the other surrounding cards you want to be playing in the deck as well. Now, the fact that Dryad Militant is a multicolored creature is really, really coming up here. Yes. Because if you take a look at Roy's Eccles, you see a second ultimate prize kit cast to take care of the Daring Skyjack. For, you know, you're doing the old Dune Blade check, which is a card that's very difficult to play right now because of Mono Black Devotion. You have to actually gear yourself towards ultimate price. As a result, you know, Dried Militant, as mediocre, bad as that creature may be, because it's super easy to kill, doesn't die to ultimate price. And so that's the one that's actually doing a lot of the damage here because the metagame has shifted in such a way that Doom Blade is not a card that Esper can really afford to play now. Yeah, a lot of the times you feel like these decisions are, you know, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Michael has taken how much extra damage in this game by having ultimate price into his deck instead of Doom Blade. Mm -hmm. Not to say that that's an incorrect metagame call, but he it is certainly coming up in this game. Yeah. You know, we have seen people moving towards, you know, a lot of talk. It, it's fun It's fun for me to be the content editor for Star City Games because, you know, you, you get to see a players kind of identify things at the same time because, you know, a, there was a lot of talk this week about Demir Charm. Three separate people were just like, you know, I think maybe Demir Charm is the way to go now. Uh, you know, we saw Adrian Sullivan write about it, Brian Braun to win. Uh, Chapin also kind of talking about it a little bit this week of like, hey, Demir Charm's like really well placed. It's a really good removal spell. Yeah, it might counter a sorcery on occasion and the other part of it is whatever, but I think this might be the place to be. We saw Stanislav Sivka in Vienna with his blue-white deck with four that's main deck. Yeah. And it just makes you wonder, you know, is that the place you want to be? Because Nightfield Spectre is such a problem card. Ultimate Price doesn't kill it. Doom Blade doesn't kill it. So you have to, you know, play these unique removal spells like Last Breath and Mirror Charm. But when you do that, you become softer against some other cards, like a card like Desecration Demon being huge and stuff like that. So it's kind of fascinating to me that the removal spells that you decide to play, it's not like you kind of in the old days where it's just like, oh, you play creatures? All right, four smothers. And we'll just kind of move on from there, making it really easy. In the beginning of this format, it's like, oh, you play creatures? Well, I just want to be a Doom Blade deck. That's part of the reason that Chapin had built the black-white deck that him and Rietzel played at the Pro Tour because Doom Blade was so good. But now, the way the metagame has grown and adapted, you don't, you don't really see Doom Blades at all anymore. Yeah, and I think this is a really a philosophical shift that you saw from uh, Wizards' development team in the last couple of years that has promoted much more healthy and fluid metagames is, like you said, instead of having Terminates, where the creatures that you add to your deck don't play against Terminate differently, mm -hmm. it's all the same thing, that leads to metagame stagnation. When the removal spell is, when the removal spells are efficient against particular things and not efficient against other things, then it leads to you wanting to switch the threats and answers you're playing in your deck from week to week, and that promotes a lot of healthy metagame churn. If I'm critical of anything, you know, that Wizards has done in the last six months, it's definitely... The reprinting of Thoughtseize combined with uh, the printing of Heroes Downfall. Not that I think Heroes Downfall is especially powerful, but it does much of the same thing in terms of the threats you're playing don't really interact very much differently. That times 10 and super powerful. And if there's any risk of metagame, like the metagame becoming unhealthy, it's because Mono Black Devotion is the best deck, and it's really hard to adapt your deck to be more efficient against the things that it does, because Thoughtseize and Heroes Downfall don't care about game text very much. Sure. Uh, but the the smaller instances of the stuff you're describing is absolutely the case. Ultimate Price versus Doom Blade versus Last Breath versus Electricaries and Shrivels and, and all that stuff is really good against some things and not good against other things and it really leads to uh, fluid and adaptable metagames which is really awesome we'll take a look at the sideboards here we'll start with michael roy since you know i love esper big esper fan I actually played esper for a little while it's kind of weird out of body experience two blood barons to go on with this two in the main deck so a little bit boarding both of those and he's got two copies of pack right in the sideboard something that we've seen people moving towards now for their esper decks um got two copies of gains a two pay the needle two copies of sin collector two negates two copies of last breath hanging out as well so it looks like he only has one pay the needle, excuse me but this is uh this is kind of what he is working with here. So I expect the Blood Barons to come in. Um, Sin Collector is a, good, a card I like in this matchup because there's a decent amount of spells in Ben's deck, but the spells that he can take are actually quite relevant. And as we get to Ben's sideboard, I wouldn't be surprised if he's sideboarding in more. And then two copies of Last Breath. I absolutely love Sifka and Vienna using those to great effect in his blue-white control deck. So some good options here for Roy. So we talked about this uh, a lot, Longquist and I at work. He feels basically against Esper that he needs to take out four copies of Azorius Arrester, and then some number of Brave the Elements. Not okay. all four need to come out, but he's uncomfortable shuffling four in game, game three. 
I think he thinks two or three are the ideal numbers. He has a copy of Burning Earth, excellent here. Two copies of Mizium Mortars, which he's bringing in specifically to fight Blood Baron. And then he has access to a Spirit Peliod and two copies of Glare Piercy. Glare is not excellent against uh, Esper at all times. It is good against Attention Sphere and is okay against Elspeth, although often the games that go long enough where Elspeth becomes a thing, you're losing to other things anyway, so it's not great. It, it is good against Attention Sphere at least. So I know he'll bring in the Burning Earth. I know he'll bring in the two Mortars. And then the two Glares and the Spear may or may not come in, depending on how many copies of Brave the Elements he wants to leave in his deck. Okay. But I would anticipate I would, I would anticipate the Spear coming in at the minimum because he needs to take out the four copies of Azorius Arrestor. So one Burning Earth, two Mizzium Mortars, and a Spear cover that. And then if he wants to cut some Braves for some Glares, that could be a thing as well. One of the the fun cards I see there in Ben's sideboard is a Fire Main Avenger, a Lost Relic. Yeah, he... Card's never seen its time in the sun. He he played it in Albuquerque, I think half because he thought it was a good idea and half on a Lark for basically mirror match type decks. Sure. And he said that it was... It got drawn a lot over the weekend and was insane every time it got drawn. I like so it. I like it. One Quest is a big advocate for one copy of Fire Main Avenger in the sideboard. Uh, he's also, in the SEG Open that he won, that slot was a War Leader's Helix. Yep. They changed it to the Fire Man. All right, so game number two going to be underway here. Michael Roy is going to be on the play here as he is down a game with Esper Control against Lundquist playing Red Right Aggro again. Excuse me, White Red Aggro again, the deck that he did win Los Angeles with. So he's going to try to run it back here. Let's take a look at the top card due to Temple of Silence. Going to leave it on top of Roy. Pass the turn over to Lundquist. So we'll see if Ben does have a one drop to start. He does. It's a dry militant, the card that cost Roy so much trouble in the first game. We'll see if it can do it again. Turn two, you see a pack rat. Aha. So I, I was wondering if he was going to sideboard this in as kind of a way to maybe steal a game, especially on the play, because the Boros deck does have some issues with this card on the play. And yeah, I, I predict that they won't be sideboarding and removal for this sort of thing. It's just once Packrat sticks, you can actually craft a game around this card, you know, assuming that you do have the third land. You do see Packrat here. I think we're all getting pretty familiar with this thing yep. by this point. And actually, uh, Packrat's actually powerful in two respects. One is, if he can drive the game out, it's, you know... Uh, potentially can win the game outright. It also is reasonable for Michael to have just blocked there on the yeah. second turn and traded. Yeah. So gives him a lot of utility and uh, a lot of ways to hedge against flooding out or just having kind of a poor draw in general because pack rack converts everything into more dirty rats. And <laughs> another thing that I like about this card, especially now that Ben has seen it, is, you know, let's say that Roy does end up winning this game as he's going to play a Water Grave on tap, move down to 16, and we'll see what his turn's going to be. But now I think that Ben actually has to seriously consider, like, maybe I need to bring in, like, my mortars, or... I, mean, I suppose they're probably in because of Blood Baron, but, you know... So see, if, if he had more rule in his sideboard, would he have to bring it in because Pack Rat can just be such a problem? You know, this game has shifted drastically on the second turn of the game from a Pack Rat showing up. Yeah, it may it, it may warrant Lundquist bringing Azorius Arrestor back in on the play. Sure. That's a, that's a thing that could potentially happen. So we do have a Pack Rat token being made here on not, the main phase. Not that, not, not that it's uh, particularly good against Pack Rat, but it's, you know... Provide some small utility. And now, an interesting art article that went up on the premium side of Star City at the beginning of this week was uh, Zvi Mashevich's article about uh, about Pack Rat and when to activate it and when not and how to attack with it and things of that nature. Really, really interesting read if you guys haven't ta haven't had the opportunity to take a look at it yet. But you know, it's it, it seems simplistic in nature, and sometimes people actually overcomplicate it where it's just like, no, just activate it and activate it again and keep doing it until they die. Yeah, since the power level of the card exponents every time you activate it, you really need a strong incentive to stop activating it once you're down that road. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, yeah, just another another beautiful strategic piece from Zvi, which he, you know, every 12 to 18 months it feels like he comes out with just some masterpiece on how to play Magic. And Inclined to agree. Yeah. Inclined to agree. I always get really excited when, when he sends me an email and says, hey, I'm writing something. I can't wait. Yes, it's approved. I'll print it. I don't care what it is. It's probably going to teach me something in a way that I would not have learned it otherwise. So Lundquist is now, he has the ability to play a Johnny, plus it on his Vorosley. He's not going to take this line. Uh, and sacrifices a Johnny and force Michael to, you know, just attack a Johnny down and... You know, make a ride on the main phase, but I think Lundquist is going to build up his board and try to use Boros Charm and Ajani to 
basically punk Michael out of this game. Yeah. War of Charm is a lot of damage. Oh, it's real. I mean, I think that Ben has to just get really creative about how you win. And on Roy's side, I don't think it it benefits him to get aggressive with Pack Rat. I think he's much better off just playing the defensive role as now Ben's going to play a Soldier of the Pantheon, play a Plains, and have Boros Charm access available. But I think that, you know, he can't shift roles as far as role assessment is concerned. He's a control deck even if he does have a Pack, pack Rat on turn two. Yeah, the, the only problem is that going down this road really exposes Michael to braid the elements. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is some incentive for him to try to get in damage when he can because completely sitting back on his heels exposes him to brave the elements, potentially exposes him to Johnny, potentially exposes him to Lundquist, just drawing enough Boros charms and getting enough random nickel and dime damage in to kill him. So you're, I believe you're correct insofar as Mike definitely is still the control deck. He needs to stay in that role, but I do believe he should be picking his spots here to get in damage because he doesn't have all the time in the world. Sure. All right, well, Michael has drawn his card for the turn. We know he has a Jace Architect of Thought in his hand. I believe he has a fourth land as well. But he's trying to figure out exactly what he wants to do this turn. This is the this is the thing, you know, going back to Zabi's article. Once you're pack ratting, you need a really strong reason to not pack ratting. We're going to go red zone, so it looks like he's just going to keep pack ratting. And, you know, this is basically saying, this is the best thing that I can do. And that's obviously not a bad thing. It's just to keep making bigger and bigger creatures and just making more and more and more of them. So actually, Lundquist has, the, if he wanted to here, he could say double block one of the rats. That would almost certainly expose, uh, that would almost certainly induce Michael to make a rat. And then Boros Charm can make his team indestructible. It was a pretty big swing. Now this is, how do you feel about this block? Because we know that Ben has a Boros Charm in his hand, but this is basically forcing him to activate uh, I don't know. It's In both instances, there's some risk that Michael just says, okay, I'll pass, if he suspects that Boros Charm is the thing that's happening here. Yeah, I guess this block, uh, it's... Because this kills both pack rats if damage resolves. So this is really interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all that Lundquist is trying to do is induce him to make a rat here so we can use Boros Charm and then have a pretty big tempo swing next turn. Okay. So that's what's going to happen. So he is going to activate Pack Rat. He's going to make a rat. You see Ben reach for his hand immediately. Going to cast Boros Charm. Uh, going to go indestructible. So no, he's not going to lose anything. And so now Roy just has an untapped rat, and that's it. He's going to play a temple. He's going to scry. See if he's going to go top or bottom with this. That's an interesting block there by Ben. Well, I like I liked trying to induce it there because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's way easier for Lundquist, I think, to win the Pack Rat this pack rat style game than if Michael is using his mana playing Jace's and, or Blood Barons and leaving his rats back on defense. Okay. So anytime you can compel him to make a rat while getting reasonable value or giving yourself an opportunity to make a big attack the following turn, uh, I think Lundquist has to pick his spots to do that. It's tough. He's kind of squeezed a little bit here, but uh, I like the path that, that Lundquist is taking. Three mana. This feels like an Ajani is going to come down. And now things even get more interesting, too, because uh, what's he going to do with a Johnny? Where does he want to put a counter if he's going to actually play that? You know, ideally, I think you want to put it on the soldier, but the soldier would trade with a rat token. Yeah, if, so, you know, how does he want to go about forcing through damage? You see him slow down a little bit, hand on his head, trying to figure out exactly how he wants to navigate this game. I think there's... Uh, he can flying double strike the Boros Elite and just send in, or he can pump one thing into... Okay. Or he can spread out a little bit. And so what he's going to do, he's going to put the counter on the Boros Elite. So Trigger Battalion, it's going to be a 4-4, along with two, two more 2-2s two that are attacking here. So Pack Rat's obviously not going to get in front of the Boros Elite. At least I believe that would be yes. the case. So he's going to force through six points of damage on this attack and put Roy down to eight. And then Roy has to actually consider taking care of Ajani because of Double Strike and everything that goes along with that card. Yeah, that's a pretty big swing in the race. I think what I like most about this play from Ben... Uh, out of everything, because, you know, you can argue if he's supposed to put the counter somewhere else with the Ajani and, and what have you, but I, I, the thing I like most about this is it makes Roy make a decision on how he wants to not only navigate his block this turn and you know, potentially save himself from damage, but how he wants to deal with Ajani, and it puts all the things
him making the right play. Is there Sacred Foundry going to come to play untapped here too? And now the follow-up is another Boros Lee, which is a very important card in this situation because now he still has access to Battalion. And that and that was actually a pretty critical land that Lundquist just played there as it means that Michael is now lethal on board as he can make a rat. They're all 4-4s four and that's 16. So if he can kill the Boros Elite, if he sends... Right? So oh, no, be, sorry, because he's a... Sorry. Yeah, no, 12 Can't this turn. No, yeah, 12 only 12, yeah. okay. Yeah, I thought it was 16 there for a minute, too. Yeah, no, only 12. You take a look, you can see Roy's hand. He has a Jace, he has a Blood Baron. And I think he's got the fifth land too. It might be it, uh, the fifth land. I think might be a Ravnica duel. Mm -hmm. You see him kind of shaking his head right now because I think it's Hollowed Fountain and God he has in his hand, and so he might have to go down to six to actually do this. But does he want to play Blood Baron? Does he want to play Jace? How much of an impact does Jace have on this game right now? Does he just want to leave mana up to activate Pack Rat? Should you just keep going down that road again? You can argue that Blood Baron is better than Pack Rat in this situation, but is it really? Because if you activate Pack Rat, you're going to have four four fours in play, and then you can actually make another one and attack for you have you would have five fives in the following turn. And also, Michael has to concern himself with Brave the Elements as well. And lastly, as we'll find out from our table spotter here, where are those Pack Rats going? Yes. There are a lot of decisions for the Esper player to make here, and it looks like he is just going all of them towards a Johnny, as a Johnny is probably the most important card here. So a Johnny bites the dust, all the rats are tapped, and so now is he going to play a Jace? Does he have a Vert in his hand that he doesn't want to cast, but he doesn't have a second White? He is going to play Jace. He's going to up that. He's going to play a Hollow Fountain, so he could have went down to six. Lundquist is going to quickly untap here. So he's got a land, and he has another land, so that's not going to get the job done. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then if you subtract three from Jace, that would be an attack for six. With Roy sitting at eight. So is there an attack that Ben Lundquist has access to that allows him to kill Chase and also still allow something like Boros trying to be a lethal draw? I think the big thing here for... Yeah, I, I actually think that Ben might have to kill Jace on this turn. You take a look at the Boros lead that has a counter on, so that's going to be a 4-4 four, four upon attacking. The other one's going to be a 3-3. Three, three. Soldier of the Pathion's going to be a 2-1, but you're also going to have those Jace triggers, assuming that Roy remembers his Jace. Don't want to forget that. That's pretty crucial now, too, because it is his card, so he does have to announce a trigger on that. And he says, yeah. all at you. So he's. it sounds like he's trying to draw towards maybe a Boris Charmer or Johnny for lethal. Yes. So the attack's going to be for six. It's going to put Roy down to two. And I like this. From, I like the, trying to shorten the game from, from Lundquist's spot, again, because of these pack rats. He almost certainly can't win this game if it goes on for another two or three turns just by the pack rats that are on board. Mm -hmm. So uh, you might as well play for a short game here. Detention Sphere, the draw here for Roy. That's a pretty important one. You know, how much does that actually affect the game? Because it can take down two Boros leads, but we're in the situation now where we're drawing towards Boros Charm anyway. Um, and we're trying to draw towards Brave the Elements as well. And I think he realizes that too. He's trying to figure out exactly what he wants to do. He's going to start by going down with Jace. Okay two, and three. So you see Jace, Architect of Thought, Island, Plains. Now here's something that's interesting. If he had just detention sphered those two Boros elites and up to Jace, Brave the Elements is no longer an out because Soldier can only attack for one. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that his play is correct or incorrect here, but there's a lot of things for Roy as the Esper player that he has to consider right now. Yeah. So here's a detention sphere. So now where before... Brave the Elements actually wasn't going to be an out, given the circumstances. That is the card that, ben, that uh, Lundquist can draw to actually win the game now. So we see a land on tap. This gives ac Michael access to a pack rat activation. Yeah, untapped lands are huge here. Yeah. And if you do truck on in with Lundquist at 17, did gain a life off the detention sphere from the soldier, I think you do truck in with, with probably everyone, and then you just make a pack rat. We don't have any tricks, and Lundquist is in a position where he can't play around anything anyway, so might as well. So now we have 
Brave the Elements, Azorius Arrestor, if it's still in the deck somehow. Yeah. Uh, Ajani. Ajani, Horos Charm. There's some draws. Mortars. Mortars. A lot of draws to get Lundquist out of the situation. Brave the Elements is one of them that could have been that could have been cut out. Mortars is one of them that could have been cut out if that Jace goes up as opposed to down. So we'll see if this ends up losing Roy the game. Yeah. Again, we know that Lundquist's hand right now, he has two lands, five life. He gets one more draw step, untaps the soldier, draw a card. It is a Dryant Militant. And that ain't it. The card that won Ben game number one for being multicolored is not going to get him out of this one. Long quest. He'll have, going, I was going saying, to a third game. He'll yeah. have to get mighty creative to, to be able to pull this one off. And he does pick up his permanent. So a lot of live draws there for Lundquist, but he does not find one of them. So Michael Roy wins game number two here between Esper Control and White Red Aggro. And if you look at Lundquist pick up his, just, you know, draw his top two cards after he conceded it was a Johnny Hamboros charm. So Really? Yes. Uh, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> a little smirk there from Benny. Now, do things change when the players are kind of shifting roles now? Ben's on the play here. Well, uh, the only question is, does Lundquist want to sideboard any differently now that he's aware that Pack Rat is a thing that's going on? It could be an incentive to bring in, let's say, going back up to four copies of Brave the Elements, assuming that he's cut one or two uh, in for game two. The Brave the Elements would have been powerful there in a number of spots. Mm -hmm. And once, you know, part of the reason to not want Brave the Elements is you know, you're worried about Supreme Verdict. Once your opponent's on a pack rat plan, they're giving up some amount of the, a lot of the power level of Supreme Verdict gets diminished because their their plans are now, you know, pulling at opposite ends of one another. Sure. So you can afford to have a little more Brave the Elements type action because you're slightly less concerned about Supreme Verdict in your opponent's deck. Uh, I don't know if Lundquist even went back to his sideboard, so I don't even know if he's changing his configuration at all. Uh, but to me, that's the big question. Does pack rat change anything out of Lundquist? On, on Roy's side, I mean, I like I like bringing in Pack Rat when you're on the play because I think you can steal a game or at least change the way the game is played. I think Pack Rat is substantially worse on the draw in this particular matchup. Uh, obviously, he's going to bring those two Blood Barons in uh, to make it four after sideboard. Uh, the rest of the choices, again, Last Breath, I think, is certainly in his deck. I think Sin Collector is in here as well. So I don't think a ton changes for him. Maybe he wants to shift Pack Rat out for something that he may have boarded in for it instead. But... I still think Pack Rat's okay. It's yeah, just I, not as dynamic on the draw. I think that I think that Michael would bring... He has two Python Needles in his sideboard. I, I think it's reasonable for him to bring in one copy. Two of the most powerful cards in Lundquist's deck in this matchup are Mutavolt and Ajani. Sure. I've run against Esper decks online that have played that card, named the Planeswalker once in play or Mutavolt once in play. It's been a reasonable use of one slot. So. Yeah, actually, it's funny that you bring that up because I always kind of forget that how good Python Needle is against Mutavolt. It seems like, I, I don't want to say counterintuitive is the right word, but a sword I'll use for this, but it's just you, you think of Python Needle as like, hey, I'm going to stop Seismic Assault. You know, or right. you know, I'm I'm boarding this in to be the end all be all card to stop your game plan until you deal with this. But in reality, Immutable is a very difficult card for Esper, and as you've seen over the course of these two games, is a very difficult card for Esper. It changes the way they have to play the game, and a Needle does a really nice job of doing of taking care of both those cards, and it's efficient at one mana, and Lundquist can't get it off the board. And if you if you watch the Esper decks lose in this matchup, as you see Michael take a mulligan here, it's very rarely because they ran out of cards. Normally what's happening is either they weren't efficient enough in the early turns, or they didn't have the right answers for the threats that were getting produced. You saw in game one, Michael died with multiple copies of Sphinx's Revelation in his hand that he didn't have time to deploy because he took so many hits from that dry militant while ultimate price was riding in his hand. That's the way the Esper deck loses these games in my mind. It's not, we traded one for one and he just had one last threat that I couldn't deal with because <laughs> Blood Baron, Elspeth, Sphinx of Revelation, all these things just shut the door on the game. Yep. So something like Pythian Needle is mana efficient and it surgically answers the cards you're most concerned about. And so even though it's not, you know, like you said, it's not answering some five mana Planeswalker or some card that Ben's deck is entirely hubbed around, The the times where you usually see needle brought in i think the way the matchup plays out having a needle or two is valuable yeah, i definitely agree with you and it, it's I, I think of a situation where i uh 
where I actually played against Guillaume Waffletapa when he was playing Esper many, uh, excuse me, playing five color control many moons ago. And he actually boarded and pinned the needle against me named Mutavault and, and was paramount to him winning that game. Um, it is quite good as Ben is going to start off with the Soldier of the Pantheon, arguably the best one drop to start off with in this matchup. Yeah, so critical against Attention Sphere and Azorius Charm. You see Lundquist's hand right now. He does have white mana. He does not have red. He's got a Dryad Militant hanging out here. He's got a Mizium Mortars that he's going to need red mana for. Also has a Daring Skyjack as well. Mm -hmm. And you can see just exactly how good a card like Shrivel would be against a start like this. Oh, yeah. Soldier comes across for two. Going to knock Roy down to 18. Lundquist did draw a Temple of Triumph for the turn, so the red mana is online. It's not something that he needs to deploy right now. I think he might want to use all of his mana to deploy the Skyjack, which is what he's going to do. In the next turn, let's say he draws Brave the Elements, he can play Dry Militant, Scry, and have Brave the Elements available. And, and furthermore, especially after playing this Watery Grave, if Ben attacks and with his two creatures here, Michael doesn't block, Ben is thrilled. Mm -hmm. It's not like he's worried about losing to Pack Rat this way, you know? He has a Skyjack available. He's a lot of pressure on. I, I think Michael almost certainly just has to block the Skyjack here. Now, one of the downfalls here to Ben not playing that Temple of Triumph is because I think he could very easily have, you know, hindsight being 20-20, he could have played Dried Militant, Scryed, this turn, go Mizium Orders, your pack right, not give him a block and get him for two. But, you know, is that better than what he actually did? Yeah, arguments can be made. If Michael doesn't block, it's, it's great for you to have advanced your board as much as possible. If Michael does block this turn, then you're happy to be able to play another threat mm -hmm. and also have that temple left over for a potential Blood Baron. Yep. So Ben's kind of happy either way this shakes out. I like I like playing the Skyjack there on the second turn. Ben Shaw last turn was another temple. He scries with this temple. He leaves his card on top, plays Militant, passes with one land up, which when you're playing against White Red Aggro, you know that means they could have Brave the Elements. We know, just like you guys do at home, that he doesn't. His hand right now is a Plains, a Temple of Triumph, and a Mizium Mortars as he passes the turn back to Roy, who untaps with a Pack Rat, but no white mana right now. Yes, and he needs to have a third land and white mana pretty fast here because just making rats is not going to be enough to keep uh, another Watery Grave, which is... A disaster for Michael, not mm -hmm. lacking white mana and taking in two more points of damage here. And this is what, you know, when I was talking about in, in the sideboard games, Michael, if he loses this game, is probably going to be with four or five cards in his hand. Yeah. It's going to be efficiency that's going to doom him and not running out of answers for threats. So let's see what Michael wants to do here, because now he's going to tap some... It looks like he's going to make a rat right away here. Okay, so... Azorius Charm that he can't even cast. He's going to make a pack rat. He's going to pass the turn back. Now, how do you feel about a main phase pack rat activation here? Because now the shields are down. Ben doesn't have to play around anything. He's working on perfect information. I have to try to beat two two twos. And Missy Moore is going to take care of that one. Yeah. And now I think he's priced in the situation of having to block here because he can't take. He can't afford to take three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, he certainly has to block now. And Lundquist can also just keep playing cards because. Michael doesn't have white mana in play, mm -hmm. meaning he doesn't have what, double next turn. And, uh, you know, Lundquist is, just doesn't have to play around Supreme Verdict at all here. There are no, uh, there are no filter lands. No. That does not No exist. Mystic Gates to nope. bail Michael out of this situation. Now, the Jola set is here, so if Michael does need a Mystic Gate, I can probably go get him one. Right. But he won't be able to use it until tomorrow. Because the Pack Rat is going to go in front of the Dryad Militant. Five damage is going to come across. Lundquist is going to follow up another during Skyjack. And now, all of a sudden, Roy is facing down a lethal damage mm -hmm. and again you know no hope of supreme verdict at least for a couple turns here yes. he draws another blue black scry land i think i see another pack right in his hand but the other the other card that he has in his hand right now that he can't even afford to cast is thought mm. that's hiding out right now a card that i actually th i actually like leaving in against boros um i think it's perfectly fine in this matchup but it's not a card that he can afford to cast right now as good as a card as that as thought is I don't. I, I think a couple of thought is totally fine against Boros. I wouldn't want four, but yeah. a few of them are pretty good. Scribe to the bottom for the temple. You see Michael at four life. He does have a Supreme Verdict in his hand, but he does not have the white mana to cast it. He's a long ways away from that. Doesn't have like an untapped land attention sphere. And we thought he might not cast the thought seize, but I think we know yeah, where we're just going. Just check here. out. The, might as well just check out the action. Absolutely. Show me that temple of triumph, <laughs> my friend. Here's a pack rat. And that is going to do it. So Ben Lundquist with white-red aggro yet again off to a nice start here. Defeats Michael Roy 
two games to one. Boros moving on, defeating Esper Control, a deck again. That win, Ben did win in Los Angeles. Part of the reason he chose to play Boros is because he felt his matchup against Esper was quite good. And judging from those three games, it does look pretty good. Yeah, it, it, you know, the, the toughest thing in my mind about the matchup from the Boros player's perspective is you're leaning very heavily on red cards. You don't always have red mana, mm -hmm. which means you had to mulligan more often than you usually do. You're going to have some games where you get ahead early but never find red.